Levi, a ballad of Mount Lu, sent to censor Lu Shuzhou. I'm just like the madman of Chu, singing my phoenix song to mock Confucius. My hand grasps the green jade staff as I set out at dawn from the yellow crane tower. Off to the five peaks, in search of immortals no matter how far. My whole life I've loved to visit mountain. Mount Lu, in its glory, rises as the pass to the southern bushel. Its flanks glow, embroidered by clouds, a ninefold screen behind the five peaks, whose shadows fall on the lake shining in green light where censor peak and twin swords stand face to face, there before the golden stone gate mountain. Rivers like the Milky Way pour down beneath three stone bridges, meeting at the great cascade beneath the censor. All around cliffs rise in broad, spreading layers of mist. Green shadows and rosy clouds glow in the sunlight. In the vast sky, no single bird is flying. I climb high between heaven and earth for this grand view. The Jansu flowing endlessly away. Yellow clouds born 10,000 miles on the wind change the color of the sky. The waterfall now like a snowy mountain with nine torrents running down. I wrote this ballad of Mount Lu, inspired by the presence of this mountain. At leisure, I looked in a stone mirror and my heart grew still. Xie Ling Yung also came here, but his footprints are lost beneath the moss. I have taken cinnabar to leave all thought of the world behind hoping a harmonious spirit would bring me closer to the Tao. I can see the immortals far off on their party-coloured clouds, holding lotus flowers as they enter the Jade Emperor's palace. So come, meet me sometime, to wander emptiness beyond the Nine Heavens, and we will travel the universe as Luau did of old. Okay, so we get here, we return to Levi, a poet that made his presence felt in the early part of this book. And this is a poem dedicated to a mountain in China, to Mount Lu. Uh, in a way, this might evoke or it might recall another poem on a mountain. If you remember, in the first section of the book, we had a poem by Du Fu uh, on Mount Tai, one of the great mountains of China. But uh, the spirit uh, and, and uh, I, the details in, the, in, in both poems, you know, are quite different. And I imagine they, they very clearly represent the different writing styles of each of the poets. So, Mount Lu. A couple of things uh, about Mount Lu. We already mentioned in previous uh, topics that mountains are always associated with the sacred in China. They always have religious connotations. They're sacred spaces. And China has five, in, in the old tradition, it had five sacred mountains, the five most important ones, but there were others. And the one that is talked about in this poem is another one. This is Mount Lu, Lushan. Lushan is in what today is the center, but in Tang times would have been the southeastern area of, uh, of, the, of the empire in the, in the region close to uh, the, the, the ending of the Jiangsu River. Very close to a very big and famous lake. In fact, I think it's uh, the biggest uh, lake in China, Poyang Lake in Jiangxi province. Now, this Mount Lu had been important in the period of fragmentation, in the period of disunion. Uh, a Buddhist establishment had been established there at the end of the 4th century by a very famous monk abbot called Hui Juan, who was the founder of the Pure Land sect. And uh, intellectuals also visited the mountain, notoriously one that appears in this poem and that we'll talk about later, Xie Ling Yung. So this is an important sacred mountain in the south of China. 
Uh, Levi composed this poem when he was almost 60, after the Anglican Rebellion and in the lower reaches of the Jan Tse, searching for uh, patronage and protection. Okay then, so the poem is very big, well, very big, there are longer poems in this anthology, but it's a relatively long poem. And uh, topics of the poem, well the main topic is landscape poetry, it's the description of a mountain, of a famous mountain in South China. And most of the poem includes quite a quite detailed narration and fiction of different uh, scenes, different sites, different areas in the mountain itself and in its surroundings. Uh, I could also say that the, almost as important as the purely uh, descriptive aspect of this poem is its religious aspect. It's very clearly, and I imagine you've seen it very clearly, imbued with Taoist imagery and Taoist ideology. Remember? Let's make a quick uh, sum up of Taoist ideology. Um, Li Bai is generally at loggerheads with the traditional Confucian beliefs, as Taoism, as a religion, was also at loggerheads with traditional Confucian beliefs. Taoism believes in following one's nature. It's a bit of an anarcho, uh, anarcho-ecologist, uh, individualistic Chinese religion. So it believes in uh, rejecting culture, civilization, uh, rejecting position and power, rejecting language and rational uh, thought patterns and uh, social conventions. It defends retiring from the world, meditating, trying to connect with the cosmos. Tao means something completely different for the Taoists and for the Confucianists. For the Taoists it's uh, the unwritten and uh, uh, illogical or, or, or difficult to perceive logically law of the cosmos, of the cycles of nature, of the cycles of the seasons. And a very common ideal or objective for Taoist practitioners is to achieve immortality. They believe it is possible through meditation, religious, dietetic, and uh, mystical practices to transcend the flesh and uh, to float to some of the different heavens and to become a xian, a transcendent, an immortal. Okay, so let's go on with this poem. This poem is a heptasyllabic old style poem. Uh, very interesting though, I've checked, uh, uh, I've checked a version with the original Chinese and I've noticed that although most of the lines are heptasyllabic, a few are pentasyllabic. In fact, two sections of the poem, the introduction and then the last part, are clearly delineated in, in the original Chinese poem by the fact that are, they are introduced each section by a couplet of pentasyllabic uh, lines. So, parts of the poem, I think the poem has three parts, in spite of this division in two, uh, that, that seems to be already ingrained by the author, I would say there's a, a triparted division, because I would divide the first section into two. Uh, but let's go couplet by couplet, and we talk about that uh, in a minute. So let's start. So the poem starts. First couplet. I'm just the madman of Chu. I'm just like the madman of Chu, singing my phoenix song to mock Confucius. So this is a poem that is uh, laden with uh, cultural references which we have to decode. So the poem starts with Li Bai adopting the persona of the madman of Chu. Now the madman of Chu was a minor character that appears in the Confucian classics. He was this crazy guy from the south that Confucius encountered and he made fun of Confucius. Uh, he sang a song called the Phoenix Song, in which he was making fun of Confucius for his suffering and for his obsession with changing things in the world of politics. So the madman of Chu would have been perhaps what we would call a proto-Taoist, uh, a, a person who believed that putting the focus on changing society and politics is pointless and stupid. So from the first couplet, Levi is clearly telling us that in this poem at least, his persona is that of a Taoist. He is like the madman of Chu. He's in the south, by the way. He's in the old region of the, of the state of Chu. So he is just like that madman, and he is making fun of Confucian values, Confucian moralities. In this poem, he's going to be 100% Taoist. And the second couplet confirms this. My hand grasps the green jade stuff as I set out at dawn from the yellow crane tower. Now, both images, uh, the green jade staff and the yellow crane tower, are Taoistic images. So the 
the, the green jade staff, the mystical staff of jade, is one of the objects that, uh, that uh, Taoist immortals hold in, in the pictures. Yellow Crane Tower was relatively close to Mount Lu, relatively close, it was in Wuhan in Hubei province, and uh, it was a tower uh, that was built on the site where it was imagined that a man had achieved immortality by flying away uh, on the back of cranes, you know, golden cranes. It's an interesting place, Yellow Crane Tower, by the way, it has been rebuilt recently, and it's the site of some poems between, some poems composed on a meeting there, I think there is one by Li Bai, one by Men Haoran, and probably one by another poet, maybe one Chang Ling. Okay, but anyway, these two objects and these two places, the Green Jade Staff, the Yellow Crane Tower, emphasize the, mm, the, the Taoistic imagery of this poem. Li Bai is in a quest. He's in a Taoist quest to fly out at dawn from the Yellow Crane Tower to grasp the, gradin, the Green Jade Staff, that is, to follow the Taoistic path of enlightenment in his trip to Mount Lu. And he says, off to the five peaks, next couplet. And this is the first of the heptasyllabic couplets, by the way. So his hands grasp the green jade staff. He sets out at dawn from the yellow crane tower. Where is he going? Next couplet, off to the five peaks in search of immortals, no matter how far. My whole life, I've loved to visit Mount Lu. Now, I would say with this, uh, with this couplet, I would say the first uh, subpart of the poem finishes. Uh, uh, in, in this first, uh, I don't know how many couplets were these. They were, I think, uh, two or three. So here we get the introduction to the poem. Levi is telling us, okay, uh, this is a poem in a Taoist mood. Uh, uh, take a look at this Taoist imagery. Uh, I've always liked to visit mountains for religious and inspirational purposes, and uh, that's what I'm going to do now. The next section, uh, which, uh, as I say, in the original there is no break because uh, the last couplet that we've read is the is the, the first of the heptasyllabic couplets, and now we have a whole bunch of uh, heptasyllabic couplets non-stop. So after this, this first introduction, the next couplets are going to describe us Lu Mountain. Yeah. Uh, the five peaks uh, were mentioned uh, a minute ago. The five peaks are the five great mountains of China, but he, Levi, is traveling to other mountains. In fact, now he is traveling to Mount Lu. So as I said, the next section of the poem will describe us what can be seen and appreciated at Mount Lu. Let's see. Mount Lu, in its glory, rises as the pass to the southern bushel. Its flanks glow embroidered by clouds, a ninefold screen beneath the five peaks. So first couplet, and in the first couplet, we've got uh, Mount Lu directly mentioned, it, the mountain rises high and high, almost as much as the stars. The southern bushel is a, a constellation in, in heaven. And uh, so it rises high up, almost touching the heavens, and its flanks glow, and they are embroidered by clouds. So uh, they, this is true even today. Mount Lu is famously surrounded by clouds and mists most of the year. So these clouds that surround the mountain are equated to brocade, to a beautiful brocade in nine folds around the peaks. So the peaks, next uh, pair of couplets. So we get the mountain, yeah, which is rising high, and we get the clouds surrounding it. He say its flanks glow embroidered by clouds, a ninefold screen beneath the five peaks. And this connects, the five peaks now connects to the next line, to the next couplet, really. Whose shadows fall on the lake, shining in green light. Where sensor peak and twin swords stand face to face. There, before 
the Golden Stone Gate Mountain. So uh, we get now a description of other aspects of the mountain. So those high peaks that the mountain has uh, make shadows, and those shadows reflect on the lake, shining in green light. So in this version of, in this translation of the poem, and in others, the lake uh, is not explicitly referenced to, but as we mentioned earlier, this would be the Lake Poyang, which is relatively close to, to, to Mount Blue, and it's a big lake. So the peaks reflect and create a beautiful pattern on the lake, probably a greenish, blackish, jade-like uh, reflection of the light and darkness on top of the waters of the lake. So whose shadows fall on the lake shining in green light, whose sensor peak and twin swords stand face to face there before the golden stone gate mountain. So within Mount Lu there is a peak or a mini mountain, which is called, in this poem, it's called Golden Stone Gate Mountain. So in front of this Golden Stone Gate Mountain, there is a couple of peaks, yeah, double peaks, the sensor peak and the twin swords standing face to face. So we get an image of, uh, here we get an image of a big mountain and two, or a big peak, and two other peaks like standing guard in front of them. And uh, the beauty here is also the evocativeness of the names of the peaks. Yeah? Golden Stone Gate, Twin Swords, Sensor Peak. You know, the names are pretty evocative, pretty suggestive. Next couplet, we continue describing the sights and the elements of Mount Lu. Rivers, like the Milky Way, pour down beneath three stone bridges, meeting at the Great Cascade beneath the sensor. So we had stone, we had peaks, and now we have water, water flowing. Rivers like the Milky Way yeah, pour down beneath three stone bridges. So we can imagine that the poet has shifted his case from the peaks a bit down. Now he sees rivers flowing. They're bright, long, big, similar to the Milky Way, which was perceived in Chinese culture as, as a heavenly river. And the waters are, you know, pouring down under three stone bridges. And they meet together, they get together to form a big cascade beneath the sensor. Remember the sensor, we've mentioned it previously in, in, in the previous couplet, sensor peak is a mountain. But again, we have the, the evocation of the names of these objects. Yeah? So a huge cascade beneath the sensor. You could almost imagine that the foam, the white foam of the cascade is like the smoke rising from Sensor Mountain. Perhaps that's the reason why Sensor Mountain was called with that name. Okay, we continue. Another pair of couplets. And the uh, interesting thing is that the description now starts to get a bit more, more generic. So the poet seems to expand his case, not only on highlights of the mountain, but also on the surrounding areas, as we shall see. All around cliffs rise in broad spreading, in broad spreading layers of mist. So there should be a comma. All around cliffs rise in broad spreading layers of mist. Green shadows and rosy clouds glow in the sunlight. So now as I said the gaze goes from the mountain itself to its surroundings and we have a tapestry, a big big background of curving cliffs soaring and soaring towards the blue sky and surrounding uh, Mount Blue. Yeah? Those cliffs like broad layers of mist. Green shadows and rosy clouds glow in the sunrise. The sun is rising and it's creating those beautiful colors of dawn, of morning, the pinks, uh, the greens, the shiny brightness of the colors. We continue. In the vast sky no single bird is flying. I climb high between heaven and earth for this grand view. So from the hills, we now go to the heavens. The heavens are a vast expanse, so vast that no single bird can be seen flying over it. And from this high point, from this high vantage point, a grand view of heaven and earth is shown to the poet. 
which is going to briefly expostulate in a minute. So remember, mountains in China, the elevation, the, the insight that can be achieved, not only the expansion of the view, but also the expansion of the mind. What does uh, the poet see? Next couplet. The Jiangzi flowing endlessly away. Yellow clouds born 10,000 miles on the wind change the color of the sky. So the river, remember the mountain, Mount Lu is close to the ending of the Yangtze River, so we can see the waters of the river flowing and flowing and flowing away, and also yellow clouds, yeah, pushed by the wind and changing in colors, we imagine under the effect of, of the sunlight, yeah, shed light and darkness. And finally, to finish this part and the description of Mount Lu, the waterfall, now like a snowy mountain with nine torrents running down. So we, we got the description of a waterfall before, now that waterfall is like a snowy mountain with nine torrents running down. So we get back, we continue with the water imagery, water, the Jiangsu, the yellow clouds in the air and the waterfall. Okay, so this could be the end of the second part of, of, of the poem, and now we have a last part. Uh, again, as I, as I said before, this is introduced, this part is clearly separated from the previous part of the poem, because it's introduced by a pair, a couplet of um, pentasyllabic verse. But, but also the tone changes to a more philosophical and religious one instead of a a descriptive one, although the first couplet, or the first two couplets, still reference us to Mount Lu. They are a transitional uh, group of couplets. So let's see. I wrote this ballad of Mount Lu, inspired by the presence of this mountain. So, so the mountain has, has inspired the poetry. At leisure I looked in a stone mirror, and my heart grew still. Xie Lingyu also came here, but his footprints are lost beneath the moss. So climbing the mountain, uh, Li Bai has achieved a sort, an illumination of sort. He has calmed the passions of his heart, which is a Buddhist but also a Taoist uh, objective. Looking at the stone mirror, I imagine the stone mirror could be a metaphor for the mountain itself, or, or it could be a lake that exists in the mountain, I'm not sure. But anyway, through contemplation of this natural landscape, the passions of Levi have subdued. But he thinks, and, and he reminds himself, of another famous poet, Shailing Jung, who was also here. Shailing Jung, the Duke of Kangle, was a very important poet of the early 5th century, late 4th, early 5th century, the period of this union. He was an important poet, an aristocrat. He was the founder of the natural poetry, not in the style of Tao Qian, of, of gardens and fields, but of the wild nature of mountains and, uh, and uh, forests. He was a, an avid mountaineer. He was also a, a very Buddhist uh, poet. And so he has lots of poems uh, describing outings in the mountains, explorations of the mountains. And he was very closely tied to Mount Lu. He was a patron of the Buddhist monk we mentioned earlier, Hui Yuan, who had founded the Eastern Forest Temple in Mount Lu, and he did some translations and other literary commissions for, for Hui Yuan. So, in this mountain, the traces of the poets of old linger, just as a new and good poet, I mean, Levi isn't being very humble here, he is equating himself with Xie Ling Yun, uh, also makes his presence felt trying to follow the footsteps, even though they're covered by moss, of shading you. I have taken cinnabar to leave all thought of the world behind, hoping a harmonious spirit would bring me closer to the Tao. So now we get into the more Taoistically clear part of the poem with, with the beginning. Uh, one of the things that Taoists did to achieve immortality was consume pills. They believed that cinnabar, which is a compound 
a mineral or compound uh, that gives a very shiny, bright, lustrous red color, but which is toxic actually, because it contains mercury. Well, the Taoists thought that this compound, uh, cinnabar, allowed you to achieve immortality. In fact, many, many, many Taoists and even a few emperors uh, died because of uh, mercury poisoning, because of consuming cinnabar. So, Levi wants to leave the world behind. He's taking cinnabar pills, yeah, and he is uh, hoping to become closer, to become one with the Tao. Yeah. In, in the original, the reference here to a harmonious spirit, hoping a harmonious spirit would bring me closer to the Tao, uh, in the original, the verse says something like strumming the heart like I would a lute, which is a technical term uh, from, 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 from Taoist imagery and Taoist uh, practice. Yeah. Making the heart soothing and serene. I can see the immortals far off on the party-colored clouds holding lotus flowers as they enter the Jade Emperor's palace. So uh, Levi seems to have a vision at the top of Mount Lu, uh, a hallucination, a vision of uh, the world of the Taoist immortals. From the top of this mountain, he sees the immortals. The immortals were believed to float in the heavens and uh, travel in multicolored clouds. So he thinks he is seeing them yeah, far away there, uh, the immortals holding lotus flowers as they enter the Jade Emperor's palace. The Jade Emperor was the ruler of uh, one of the Taoist divinities, the ruler of at least one of the heavens. And the last couplet. So come, meet me sometime, to wander emptiness beyond the nine heavens, and we will travel the universe as Luau did of old. So the conclusion. We're escaping from Mount Lu, and uh, Levi is dreaming, is hoping to escape the world, to float away into the higher heavens uh, like the immortals of the remote past. He, uh, you know, the Taoists believed there were different heavenly realms. I think in the original, Levi says something like uh, he wants to escape to the the highest of the the, the highest of the heavens, uh, the highest of the firmaments, and he is mentioning here people who escaped there. Notoriously, uh, Luau, Luau roamed into the highest purity, uh, into the highest reaches of heaven. That's uh, the the Tai Ching. The sky's greatest uh, and highest region. And uh, he wishes to join that man of old, Luau, who was a you know, person from the Qin dynasty, that is to say, some 800 years before Li Bai, who had been one of the, the guys who sought elixirs of immortality for the emperor, who was believed to have become a transcendent. Okay, so this is the longest, uh, well, probably one of the longest, if not the longest poem readings as yet. Uh, interesting poem, uh, probably quite in the style because of its Taoistic imagery and slightly hyperbolic images at time and intense coloring, uh, quite in the style of Levi, I would say, and of Taoistic poetry in uh, general, and quite a nice poem.